welcome back to the channel. This is turn three, what happened in our Shenandoah Valley campaign. Uh, it was quite an exciting one. If you haven't already, do please like and subscribe to the channel and also go and check us out on Facebook. Uh, join us there so that way you'll never miss out any updates, whether it's campaign, painting, scenery, you name it, we've got it. So back to the campaign. What happened this turn? In the north, Jackson and Yule were given their orders. They were to keep attacking, keep pursuing, and keep trying to take ground. So they set off um, towards Front Royal and Strasbourg. In the centre, we, for the Confederates that is, had a few detachments holding Harrisonburg um, and General Johnson holding the passes in the south. From the Union perspective, their forces in the north were ordered to hold in place, whilst General Fremont came across from Brandywine to attack Harrisonburg. Uh, and in doing so, the plan was that he would split the supply lines for the Confederates. So this turn saw three battles, one for Strasbourg, one for Front Royal and one for Harrisonburg. So first up we had the battle for Strasbourg. This was the largest of the three battles and that had Jackson and Ashby for the Confederates uh, going toe to toe with Union forces under Generals uh, Banks and Shields. Uh, it was going to be a hard one because the Union had more troops. Um, so as you can see here the Union had three artillery pieces, one cavalry and I think it was six infantry regiments versus five infantry and two artillery for the Confederates. Uh, Confederates also had two cavalry detachments. Um, <clears throat> the Union dug in well um, along the whole line. The only, I guess you could say, benefit for the Confederates was that uh, General Banks is a, slash, a cautious slash unsure commander, so that meant that for his orders to be followed, each unit had to roll a dice, and on a certain number they'd be able to activate, otherwise they misinterpreted his orders or something of that nature. Um, so it did mean that he wouldn't be able to necessarily coordinate all of his forces across the board. So at the end of turn one, we saw the Confederates advancing and spreading out. The cavalry were flanking, mm -hmm. whilst the Union battle line just shifted slightly to the east. Uh, but other than that, no real change apart from one unit pulling back. During the shooting, the central unit took a hit and General Banks took a minor wound. Uh, the Union fired on the Confederate cavalry and inflicted a couple of casualties, but nothing too major. And the Central Infantry Regiment took a hit, but nothing too major. At the end of turn two, the Confederates continued their advance. Uh, unfortunately for them, their brigadier did get killed. On the right wing, the Confederate cavalry pushed forwards. They did take a volley of musket fire, but overall, luckily got away relatively unscathed. Uh, during the shooting phase, the Confederate artillery targeted the infantry on the right and the infantry on the far left, whilst the Infantry in the centre concentrated on Union artillery piece. So, still everything to play for. Casualties are slowly starting to gain. So, turn three started off with a rebel yell and two regiments charged forwards into the centre of the Union lines to try and split it in half. Whilst the cavalry kept flanking round just to try and split the Union forces and try and create some division and some gaps for us to exploit. Uh, it's a bit of a risky turn, sending those troops forwards in the centre, but a gap had opened so it was time to try and exploit it. So at the end of turn four, the Confederates had been advancing steadily. In the centre the push came and they reached the town but were forced out. The Central Regiment charged the centre and during the fight and killed General Banks. Um, General Banks having died, two of his regiments did break. Um, so overall, not a brilliant turn for the Union Centre, although the Confederate units are pretty well destroyed in the process. 
so it's still anything to go for, but an interesting game. Turn 4 saw reinforcements for the Confederates reaching the centre. Uh, however, the troops who had broken through into the town centre were then charged in their flank, unfortunately for them. Uh, the Union reinforcements did arrive this turn, that was cavalry and artillery at the bridge. Um, so although the Confederates had started to make gains in the fact that they'd broken two Union regiments, um, now the reinforcements were coming in, so they were pretty well back to parity. Okay, so at the end of turn six, the fighting in the center has gone both ways. Union have pushed back on the left, Confederates have pushed in in the center, but overall, the Confederates' numbers of casualties have grown, and so the Confederates are going to withdraw from the battle. Uh, they've done enough damage to prevent a Union pursuit, uh, but if they carry on, the reinforcements are going to start to tell and probably cause too many casualties. So, Confederate withdrawal and a Union victory. Then we head slightly east and we get to Front Royal where we've got the Confederates marching up from the south against the garrisoning forces of the Union. Uh, the Union have more units overall um, but their downside is that a one of the units is coming on as a reinforcement at a random turn and secondly their force is mostly made up of the detachments from previous turns so they're relatively small individual units whilst the Confederates, although they have fewer, have larger, more experienced regiments. Uh, so that's going to come into play. So the objectives for the Confederate force is to occupy the village and the Union is to hold them up. Uh, pretty as simple as that. Turn 1 sees the Confederates advancing and the Union just repositioning in the town. One artillery hit and that's it this turn. Mm -hmm. So at the end of turn 2, Confederates have carried on their advance and the Union are attempting to withdraw from the town. So they're heading up this road which will take them to Winchester. Turn 4 saw the Confederates continue their advance and they've nearly moved into the village whilst the Union troops are marching out in good order. Turn 5 sees Front Royal fall to the Confederates as the Union troops continue their withdrawal. So turn 6 again sees all of the Union infantry having withdrawn up towards Winchester and the cavalry just screening the withdrawal. And for Harrisonburg, although we didn't actually fight the battle, the Confederates did a fighting withdrawal, so did inflict some casualties to both sides, uh, but we didn't actually fight the pitch battle. So where does that leave our positions? Uh, the Confederates are in the centre, they've been pushed back to a smaller village just outside Strasbourg, and that's Jackson's command. General Ewell has taken Front Royal, um, General Johnson is still in the south, and that's it for the Confederates. As for the Union player, uh, General Banks is dead, so uh, General Shields is in charge in the north, General Fremont is in charge in the centre. And so after those battles, how are the different armies looking? So General Jackson and Ashby, uh, you can see there that their forces have suffered uh, a reasonable number of casualties overall, um, probably about 20% casualties I would say approximately, although I could probably be more accurate if I did the math so I'm just looking and kind of having a rough guess. Um, so that's why they pulled back when they did to try and keep the majority of the army intact. General Yule, uh, his army was unscathed because the Union withdrew from Front, Ro uh, Front Royal, so they were able to put a few artillery shots into the Union as the uh, Union forces were pulling back, uh, but no casualties inflicted on the Confederates, so that was quite a benefit for us, uh, us Confederates. And the forces at Harrisonburg, um, again they suffered about a third of their troops as casualties in one form or another, so they did suffer quite badly. Uh, but they were able to extricate themselves intact. As for the Union, so as we said, General Banks has died, uh, but their army overall did suffer pretty comparably, uh, maybe even slightly higher as a percentage casualties than the Confederates, um, but overall they held the field and they've got 
quite a strong large army still intact to either go on the defensive or take the offense next turn. Yeah, so losing a commander will give the Union a negative, or give the Confederates, I should say, a positive victory point. Um, at Front Royal, again, the Union troops, by getting hit by artillery as they were withdrawing, they took a few casualties, but nothing, nothing too major really, just that one infantry brigade. And a couple of hits on the cavalry, but that should be recovered pretty quickly. And then at General Fremont down at Harrisonburg, again, they were attacking into the town, so they did take some casualties, uh, but nothing too major overall. They're still a pretty strong formed army. Now we get to the interesting part, our battle plans for the next turn. So Union option one is just a general advance on all fronts uh, with Fremont uh, pursuing the retreating Confederate force towards Staunton. Um, with the attempt of just uh, destroying them and then capturing that rebel base. Option two is for General Fremont to march north to try and catch Jackson, whilst the Northern Union forces all aim to move towards Manassas Junction to stop Ewell from taking those supplies and try and destroy him. Uh, option three sees Shields and Fremont try and catch Jackson in a pincer, uh, whilst in the south we attack J uh, Johnson, and in the north our Union forces try and uh, protect Manassas Gap at all costs. And option four sees an attack in the south to try and t uh, push Johnson back, an attack from Shields to try and catch and destroy Jackson, um, and another sort of counter-attack trying to envelop Ewell over at Front Royal, and we leave Fremont in the centre, that way he can uh, manoeuvre wherever he's required. And as for our Confederate options, uh, option number one is for General Yule to march on at all haste to try and take Manassas Gap and take those supplies and destroy it as a depot. Jackson holds where he is, um, and that way he can react in due course as to what the Union forces do. Uh, the detachments down just north of Staunton hold, but are under orders to basically block that area in case Fremont comes down whilst Johnson goes on the offensive to try and clear that gap and gain a bit of room to manoeuvre. Option two sees Johnson attacking again in the south, whilst Jackson marches south with his force and tries to catch General Fremont in a pincer movement using the uh, reinforcement detachments from the south. General Yule again goes after Manassas Gap. Option three is Pretty well the same again, but instead of coming south, this time Jackson just goes after Strasbourg for a second time. Uh, depending on what the Union player does, it may be weakened because they may take troops elsewhere. And then option four is a bit of a wild card, but I think it would actually pay off. And that is for Jackson to slip off through the mountains and start to do a march towards the Union supply depots. Uh, he, if he can catch them, then once they're caught and they're destroyed, they no longer supply armies. Uh, they wouldn't be able to rebuild them in time. So if he can start to knock those off, uh, that's really going to be beneficial for the Confederates. And whilst he's doing that, Johnson's going to attack in the south. Uh, those detachments just north of Staunton, they're going to go after Fremont again just to try and pin him in place. And General Yule is going to carry on his assault, as with all the other options, to get that Manassas Gap. Anyway, I'll be looking forward to hearing what you have to say in the comments down below, so do please comment. Uh, the polls will be released, hopefully, as soon as this video is, so you'll be able to go straight over there now and cast your votes. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens in turn four. So I'll see you there, guys. Thanks again.